Well, good morning or good afternoon. We're going to give folks just a moment more to uh, join us. It looks like we have a good sized group of about 500 or so folks um, and welcome. Uh, my name is Joy Burkhardt and I'm the executive director of the Policy Center for Maternal Mental Health. And we are so glad you're here today for our fireside chat titled the latest in maternal suicide trends uh, this maternal suicide awareness month. It's also a suicide prevention and awareness month more broadly. Joining me today is Cindy Herrick, the research and editorial manager here at the Policy Center for Maternal Mental Health. Cindy is an MA and also a certified peer support specialist in, in Arizona. She also has her perinatal mental health certification um, and is working on her PhD at Arizona State University with an emphasis on maternal suicide. Her research will focus on maternal suicide. We're so glad to have Cindy with us today. I wanted to share a little bit about the background that the Policy Center has had in working with organizations, including uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, on maternal suicide. Um, before I go into that detail, I just want to let you all know that we have our Q&A um, feature enabled in Zoom, so you're welcome to ask questions throughout the 45 minutes that we have together today, and we will specifically take questions at the end of today's presentation, and we encourage all questions. I also want to share that this is a very technical issue, and so if we don't have the answer for you, we can certainly get to uh, get in touch with the CDC and make sure that we're providing you with all of the latest data to answer your questions. So I wanted to share that our work here at the Policy Center for Maternal Mental Health um, began in 2018 around maternal suicide tracking. Uh, I will drop some links um, here uh, into the Q&A in just a moment um, to share with all of you, actually into chat, excuse me, to share with you um, some of the early blog posts um, starting, as I mentioned, in 2018 with a meeting with certain um, experts here in the field of maternal mental health, a few reproductive psychiatrists, also AMCHIP, um, the Association of Maternal Child Health Programs joined us on that early call with the CDC to talk about maternal suicide tracking and what was happening. We, we learned from the CDC at that time that it was the Pregnancy Mortality Surveillance System that they call PMSS, uh, which was launched in 1986 that was being used to track maternal deaths, not just maternal suicides throughout the United States at the time, through um, their vital statistics data, which essentially uh, looked at death certificate data. So we learned that that checkbox on the death certificate uh, to indicate whether someone was pregnant um, or in the postpartum period and or died by suicide was problematic um, for a couple of reasons. And that really the gold standard was to have committees in states, which we'll talk about in just a moment, um, look at uh, medical records and look at death certificate data and piece together a story. Um, and some of those committees, which we'll, again, we'll talk about here in just a moment, are doing things like making outreach calls to um, uh, providers and patient families when appropriate as well. So the gold standard is really to do this in-depth review of maternal deaths, including maternal learning if a death might be a maternal suicide. You know, nonetheless, even though um, there wasn't a comprehensive process in place for those committees in 2018, we encouraged the CDC to uh, look and report, look at and report maternal suicide data, even if it wasn't as strong of data as we all wished it was. And in 2019, it was the first year that the CDC reported on uh, maternal suicide. I'll drop those chats, uh, links to chats to our blog posts um, around that data uh, as well in just a moment. So since then, we've been tracking and reporting on data collection efforts here in the United States through our blog posts, webinars like this, including webinars with speakers, um, including the CDC and others. And just last year, we issued an issue brief on maternal suicide, and we can flip to the next slide, Stacey, maternal suicide, um, which we're going to be dropping into chat here um, today. It was recently refreshed 
uh, to include the data that the CDC reported last year in 2022, which we'll be talking with you about here in a moment. Before we jump into maternal suicide um, specifically, I wanted to give you an overview about maternal mortality more broadly here in the United States for context. And we can go ahead and move to the next slide. So I think all of you have um, are well aware that um, here in the United States, our maternal mortality rates have been rising substantially and are substantially higher than other developed nations, even underdeveloped nations um, in the world. And specifically, I wanted to share that just in March of 2023, the CDC has reported that our maternal mortality rate in the US is 10 times higher than the rate of other developed nations. Uh, the Century Foundation uh, included this uh, image on prior data, but still illustrates the, the, uh, the this substantial problem that we face in our higher maternal mortality rates. Um, and then we also um, uh, wanted to share our rate has continued to rise year over year, which is really troubling. Um, and you can see that the deaths per 100,000 births here in the United States were 32.9 deaths per 1,000 in 2021, the latest, latest uh, data set that is available. Um, and you can see the slightly lower rates um, in 2020 and 2019. So substantial problem that we're facing and that suicide um, and maternal mental health conditions sort of sit within this larger context. Next slide. I also wanted to share some additional general information about maternal mortality um, and among what is called pregnancy related deaths. We'll talk about that term in just a moment uh, where information on timing was available um, in the latest, latest data set, 53% um, of those deaths occurred, occurred seven days to one year at the end of pregnancy. Um, so seven days to one year at the end of pregnancy. So it's not necessarily deaths in, um, in, during labor and delivery, although we certainly hear about tragic cases um, and don't want to diminish those, those cases, but a majority of deaths are happening seven days to one year um, post-pregnancy, the end of pregnancy. 84% uh, or four in five of those deaths overall are determined to be preventable. And then with regard to maternal suicide, 80% are deemed to be preventable. We'll talk about prevention here in a moment. Um, and with that, uh, we can move to the next slide. And I'm gonna ask Cindy um, on our team to talk a little bit about maternal mortality before I turn it over to her to talk about pregnancy associated and pregnancy related deaths. I did also want to just quickly share that the World Health Organization was the first to define um, maternal mortality, and they initially uh, and still define it as death within 42 days post end of pregnancy or post birth. Um, and so you'll see that floating around out there, but largely here in the United States, um, our definition of maternal mortality is death within um, pregnancy or one year postpartum. So now we're going to unpack some of those um, definitions, pregnancy related, pregnancy associated, and Cindy has a nice graphic, which comes from uh, the issue brief that I'll drop a, a link to here in just a moment um, into chat. So we encourage you to take a closer look at the issue brief. And Cindy, I'll turn it over to you to tell us a little bit more about these terms. Great. Thank you so much, Joy. Um, I th There are a lot of terms that uh, we want to unpack here. But most importantly, um, the few terms that you should understand within a maternal mortality world is pregnancy-associated death. It's, uh, so according to the CDC, death within one year um, of pregnancy, regardless of cause, is considered a pregnancy-associated death. Um, these deaths make up the universe of maternal mortality, which, um, as Joy had said before, uh, maternal death defined by WHO is 42 days, but in the U.S., maternal mortality is up to a year after um, and so these break down into two categories, pregnancy related death. So it's a death that occurs during or within one year of pregnancy from a pregnancy complication or a chain of events initiated by the pregnancy or um, the aggravation of any unrelated condition by a physiological effect of pregnancy. 
And then we also have pregnancy associated but not related death. Um, this is also a death within one year of pregnancy, but it's from a cause that is not related to pregnancy. And so sometimes it can get really confusing between what is you know, pregnancy associated but not related and what is pregnancy related. And so we included um, you know, that one way to differentiate between pregnancy related and pregnancy associated but not related is to ask the question of whether or not the birthing person or the woman would have died if she wasn't pregnant. And if the answer is yes, then it is pregnancy associated, but not related. Um, if the answer is no, then it is deemed to be uh, pregnancy related. That's great, Cindy. Thank you so much. And that, that can get quite confusing. Um, one of the latest reports from the CDC, which we'll talk about here in a moment, um, indicates that maternal uh, mental health conditions, including um, overdose, uh, is the leading cause of pregnancy related, uh, maternal mortality. And so that last bucket or that first bucket rather is what we're talking about here. So i um, not to get too technical, but there are a couple of terms floating around and here's a, a good overview as Cindy mentioned. So we also wanted to talk a little bit, um, about not just these terms, pregnancy associated and pregnancy related, but also what is an MMRC? And I, I imagine most of you have heard that term before that are joining us either live or watching the recording. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what MMRC stands for, but you heard me mention earlier that um, the CDC has indicated that committees that can do in-depth review of um, uh, not just looking at um, death certificates and check boxes, but also medical records and potentially even doing live interviews um, is really the gold standard for understanding the cause of maternal death, including maternal suicide. Cindy, I'm going to turn it over to you to add to um, that, that conversation. Tell us what MMRC stands for and what else is happening at the CDC to support MMRCs. Yes, so MMRC, Maternal Mortality Review Committees, um, sometimes they may fall under different names in, for different states, but generally that is the standardized term for these committees. Um, the CDC has funded 44 states um, to have MMRCs developed there and two U.S. Uh, territories to be a part of the um, enhancing review and surveillance to eliminate maternal mortality. It's a it's a mouthful, a uh, short-term Erase MM program. So that is the program that houses um, all the MMRCs and all the data from there. Um, and the CDC provides guidance and technical assistance to these MMRCs in reviewing pregnancy-associated deaths. Um, so that, again, it falls under the umbrella of, there's the two different terms underneath that. So pregnancy-related, um, but not a pregnancy related death and pregnancy associated, but not related death. Those both fall under pregnancy associated death. So it is the job of the MMRCs to review all of these deaths. Um, and it is funded through the ERASE MM program. And they basically have uh, requirements and standards for um, the for them to abstract data and enter committee decisions. And this data is improved and can better inform recommendations for preventing future deaths. Great, thank you, Cindy. And I dropped into the chat for all um, a link to the CDC's um, page on the Erase MM program. And you might also hear the term Maria. Um, some people I think have said Mariah, but it's the system where states input their maternal mortality data that the CDC can then pull from to uh, issue these important reports. We'll move on to the next slide. So I'm going to ask Cindy now, um, I, I, I dropped a link into chat at the very beginning. I'll do that again here in a moment um, to this revised maternal suicide in the United States issue brief. And I'm gonna ask Cindy to just ver verbally tell us about some of the sections that are in the issue brief, uh, Cindy. Yeah, um, so the issue brief um, first released last year, and as Joy said, we just refreshed it, um, republished it. Um, it's just a general overview of maternal suicide, which we haven't really quite seen. We've seen more of that, I think, in the recent years as awareness has increased. Um, it includes information about data collection, so kind of what we've just talked about with the MMRCs, risk factors, correlations, um, prevention and treatment, and then we follow it up with some policy and systems recommendations. Um, 
And the brief that was recently updated has the latest data from CDC, which was released in September 2022. And the punchline from that report is that the leading underlying cause of pregnancy-related deaths um, was mental health conditions. And the way they define mental health conditions under this is um, it includes deaths from suicide and overdose and poisoning related to substance use disorders. And the deaths, the 23% of the deaths were caused by these under underlying mental health conditions. Great. Uh, we're going to talk through some of the sections in the issue brief here as we continue on. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the findings. Um, we just heard about the, the first box here that you see. These are infographics that are on um, our webpage where this issue brief is listed and can be shared on social media. Uh, we're encouraging folks to share them during this month, Maternal Suicide Awareness Month, or uh, more generally, Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month. Um, so Cindy just talked about that first image. And Cindy, I'm going to turn it over to you to tell us what else do we want to know and what are the findings from these latest reports from the CDC? Yes. Um, so we also talk about, um, I think we also... To, to piggyback on the, the MMRC um, and how maternal suicides are classified, um, the MMRC currently um, has a process of going through it. And Joy had mentioned interviews with family members. Um, so maternal suicides are defined and classified now by looking at each maternal suicide case. And the MMRC committee needs to go through the series of questions and ask whether the suicide would have happened if the woman was not pregnant. Um, if the answer is yes, then it's pregnancy associated, um, but not related death. If the answer is no, then it is a pregnancy related death, meaning that if she hadn't been pregnant, she would not have died. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's not black and white because depending on the abstraction from the medical records, um, it, it can be incon inconclusive. And so the CDC has created um, recommendations and guidelines uh, to do um, informational interviews with family members so that to get more information about that. Um, here, I think, Maternal suicides can happen during pregnancy, but most of them, as Joy has said before, happens actually um, in the postpartum period and not in the immediate postpartum period. We see we see it spike between 43 and 365 days postpartum. So it's really important to keep up that support for moms and postpartum women in this space to, in order to prevent more maternal suicides. Great. Thank you, Cindy. Um, I wanted to add, I love that this is a fireside chat so we can uh, raise um, new ideas and thoughts as we go. I wanted to add that if you're curious about whether your state is um, looking at suicide closely and or doing these interviews, as Cindy mentioned, you could go to your state MMRC um, website and or uh, there are a few states that still don't have MMRCs at all, but where you would find that out as well as on the public health department website. So we encourage any of you um, or all of you now, whether you're watching live or watching the recording to go look at what is happening around maternal suicide in your state. Are there these key informant interviews as Cindy talked about, which is really the gold standard um, now in terms of maternal um, suicide and overdose uh, um, work. Uh, and and maternal suicide, maternal um, death more generally, and we encourage you to take a look and outreach your Department of Public Health if it's not clear on those websites. And all this information, there's actually a resource sheet on the MMRC page. I believe it's um, reviewtoaction.org, or just type in MMRC and review to action, and it'll pop up. But there is actually an outlined criteria on. Um, guidelines on when maternal health death should be considered, or I'm sorry, when mental health death should be considered pregnancy related. And so that's really interesting to see if you delineate like drug related deaths and suicide. So that is, um, that is something you may want to check out. Yep. Great, Cindy. Thank you. Um, let's move on to the next slide. So Cindy, I know, um, one of the concepts that we're trying to make clear and that the field um, of suicide prevention more generally is, is that there's a difference between being suicidal and having thoughts about suicide or potentially a difference, I should say. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that difference? What is suicidal ideation or versus being actively suicidal? 
And then we, we um, are starting to see some differences around race and ethnicity in the space around ideation as well. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, I think what you're talking about is the confusion sometimes between suicidal ideation and intrusive thoughts, what we call unwanted intrusive thoughts. Um, so suicidal ideation, and sometimes the lines can get blurred if somebody is not trained or doesn't know the details of um, how to classify one or the other. Um, suicidal ideation is when you have thoughts of actually committing the suicide, and there's different interpretations. There's actually um, varying definitions for that, but generally you have the intent um, and the thoughts about actual suicide. Um, ideations, you know, are unwanted thoughts. So they're thoughts that you do not want. So ego dystonic, like they go against what you, what you believe in. You don't actively want to do it, but they just pop into your head. And research has actually shown us that ex ex experiencing these intrusive or unwanted thoughts is really common during the perinatal period um, for both um, moms and dads, actually. Um, and 70 to 100% of new moms experience these unwanted thoughts, intrusive thoughts. Um, and so that research has shown that while these intrusive thoughts are really distressing, they do not actually increase the risk um, for infant harming behavior in some of them, because some of these intrusive thoughts sometimes will be harming themselves or harming the infant. Um, however, there isn't currently a lot of research about whether these intrusive thoughts increase suicide. So that's something that researchers are working on. But if moms um, have thoughts about self-harm, it's important to screen her. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But um, when you screen her for suicide to further evaluate whether these thoughts are intrusive thoughts or suicidal ideations, um, or if the clinician is trained and suspects that these are intrusive thoughts, um, there is something, intrusive thoughts are um, not always, but likely sometimes related to OCD. And so there is a screener called the OCI-12, which actually does have questions about intrusive thoughts. And that can also further help someone um, differentiate between suicidal ideations and intrusive thoughts. Um, and to, to, go, to go upon suicidal ideation though, uh, Joy, did you wanna talk a little bit about like the race in suicidal ideation, which is really interesting? Do you want me yes, to go into right. that right now? Yeah, and I think before we jump into race and suicidal ideation, um, to share that it's it the, the data shows that it's actually white, um, non-Hispanic white women that are taking their lives, uh, and so suicide is is happening in the white population. But as Cindy's going to be talking about, um, ideation is much higher in non-white populations, which is is interesting. So Cindy, yes, please um, unpack that for us a bit. Yeah. Um, so actually, since we're on the topic of race, um, one of one of the topics, one of the reports that the CDC also issued last year, along with their general um, MMRC data, was a report on American Indians and Alaska Natives. And they actually have much higher rates of pregnancy associated um, drug related deaths and suicides compared to all racial and ethnic groups. And so they do have a report on their website about this. Um, and it also shows that mental health conditions are the top underlying causes of pregnancy related death among this population. Um, and it accounted for 31.3% of deaths with known underlying cause. So that, that is something I wanted to highlight before jumping into, um, you know, delineating suicidal ideation between um, non-white uh, populations. So as Joy had said, um, non-white Hispanic people have have the highest rate of suicide in women, um, but we see really high rates um, of suicidal ideation. So thoughts about suicide uh, in Asian women, it's nine times more than their white counterparts. And in Hispanic and black women, they're two times more likely to report suicidal ideation than white women. And I believe the data is that uh, people who report, you know, other race, that they're not white, it's something like three times more than a white woman to have suicidal ideation. So these are just, it's very interesting to see the delineation of, um, percentages of suicidal ideation and, you know, completed suicide. So definitely more research is needed to explore that. Great. I'm dropping into chat. Uh, Cindy mentioned the OCI screener for intrusive thoughts. So you can find that screening tool um, on our screening tool uh, page. We're going to talk about screening for suicide risk here in just a moment as well. 
Thank you, Cindy. We can move on to the next slide. So let's talk a little bit about intervention. Um, we talked about maternal mortality review committees, and most of you know that term, MMRC. I think perinatal quality collaboratives, and that term might be somewhat new for our field um, to understand the role of these committees. They're called collaboratives, probably should be called committees for consistency. Um, and these are the committees that take the findings from maternal mortality review committees and are working on implementing interventions to reduce maternal mortality in their state um, and morbidity, so uh, improving maternal care experience more broadly. So PQCs are doing this work. There's um, some effort underway to provide more funding to states to um, uh, build up their perinatal quality collaboratives uh, through the CDC and actually a piece of legislation that's being heard in Congress um, right now, the reauthorization of the Preventing Maternal Deaths Act. Um, so if you haven't uh, looked at that bill, um, we are happy to share more with folks but uh, and, and encourage all of you to take some action and tell your members of Congress how important that reauthorization is. Right now, PQCs can look pretty different um, uh, in states. Some have been formed um, as nonprofit organizations and might have not even had paid staff. Some might be um, embedded in, in, in university uh, uh, programs or the Department of Public Health in your state might serve as the PQC and have um, a committee, for example, or a group that runs the PQC. So those um, the models look pretty different just as MMRCs do, but there's even more variation with PQCs. Uh, so we wanted to talk a little bit about what can PQCs do? And of course, MMRCs are starting to share some of this as well, but we have very specific ideas about the ways we can intervene um, to not only address maternal more, mental health more broadly, but to specifically um, uh, identify uh, suicide risk and um, provide interventions or treatment. So Cindy, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk a little bit about screening first and then treatment. And we'll also talk about the zero suicide um, program, which is featured um, pretty in depth in the issue brief itself. Yeah, Cindy. absolutely. Um, I'm actually going to kick off with the zero suicide uh, model because that's considered the gold standard for suicide care currently in the U.S. healthcare system. Um, and it has seven components that you see listed there. And within the, those components, um, there is an identify and a treat. So that includes screening and treatment, which we wanted to talk about. Um, so in terms of um, the screening element, it is definitely important to implement at a minimum um, suicide screening in OB settings for those who uh, endorse suicidal thoughts on the PHQ-9 or EPDS, depending on what is used. Um, there's a single question on both of those screeners um, asking if a person has suicidal thoughts. Um, while this is a good first step to screening for suicide risk, um, having suicidal thoughts, as we previously talked about, um, suicidal ideation, is not necessarily mean that someone is acutely suicidal or at immediate risk of imminent harm, or they could be intrusive thoughts about suicide. And so um, if a person answers yes to that question, then it is highly recommended that they uh, get assessed with suicide screeners. And, you know, there's a few out there that are really well validated, including the Columbia suicide um, severity rating scale, and then um, the ASK, the ASQ tool. And then recently, um, with the AIM bundle that had just been recommended um, where, about screening, they had also recommended the patient safety screener, the PSS, which is another screening tool that is used for identifying patients in acute care settings um, who may be at risk of suicide. Um, in terms of treatment, you know, if somebody screens positive, you know, there's different uh, evidence-based treatments right now that are recommended within the world of suicide um, interventions. And that CBT specifically for suicide is definitely something that is highly recommended. Um, historically, clinicians have sought to treat patients with suicidal behavior and thoughts by solely treating their mental health problems, like such as anxiety or depression or SUD. And while that is important, a lot of recent research has shown that effective treatment for suicide risk must target directly suicidal behavior, ideation through evidence-based models that are specifically designed 
to deal with these issues. And so CBT for suicide prevention is actually um, what is recommended. Uh, it's grounded in the principles of CBT and targeted therapies, but um, it's directed at suicidal patients. Um, and then there's also DBT, which uh, dialectical behavioral therapy, which is based in CBT, but specifically targets people who feel emotions very intensely. And there's a lot of research um, that have shown it to be effective in reducing suicidal behavior. And the last one is the Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicidality, CAMS. Um, and that is a intensive psychological treatment that is also suicide specific, and it helps patients develop um, other means of coping and problem solving to replace or eliminate thoughts of suicide as a coping strategy. Um, and in, in addition to that, um, brief intervention and follow up is really important for patients that have been identified and you know are being treated. Um, the Stanley Brown Safety Plan is a validated brief intervention that is widely used by clinicians to mitigate acute suicide risk. So it's a safety plan for for them to implement in place for patients. That's great, Cindy. I um I dropped into the chat a link to the screening tool page on our website, which the tools um, that Cindy mentioned are are listed here. And I'll just add that the safety planning work I think is particularly an opportunity for our network in maternal mental health. I think uh, many of us have heard horror stories about uh, um, patients who may uh, speak about either intrusive thoughts about suicide or act or, or feeling actively suicidal and be sent to the ER um, where they may be held for 48 hours or so um, until they can be assessed by a psych psychiatrist who may deem them to be not a true um, at imminent harm and then be released um, home. And so, you know, the, the path that we see as being helpful here is for obstetric providers um, or primary care providers who are doing the screening in May, identify suicide risk, to um, do the safety planning work um, directly um, while of course uh, navigating the challenging situation with regard to accessing psychiatrists um, or next steps. There, there's an opportunity for us to um, avoid the ER um, room and, and that tragic situation which is half happening far too often. Um, and so we're really interested in, in partnering with OB clinics who are interested in going deeper here along with our partners at Zero Suicide around um, what next. So I, I do this, I do the safety planning, but what else can I do to support this patient rather than send um, her or them to the ER uh, and, and not actually get the get them the help that they need. So thank you, Cindy, for that. Um, and I do see some, some Q&A in the chat. I said we were going to wait, but a few folks have raised some treatment options um, that they want to flag. Cindy's talking about the treatments that are specifically evidence-based for suicide risk, those who are actively suicidal, but there are, of course, other treatments to prevent um, those who are suffering from maternal mental health disorders to get to that point potentially um, earlier, including ketamine has been brought up. And we're going to be talking about ketamine and other treatments, novel treatments um, in the latest research at our upcoming forum in March. I'll drop a link into chat here in just a moment, but thanks for flagging that. Um, we'll move on to the next slide. So Cindy, we, um, we talked a little bit about what's in the brief, but we thought it'd be fun to highlight some of the other research outside of the data that the CDC is reporting on and or um, the interventions that we just spoke to that we addressed in our issue brief. Um, and what the latest research is showing around risk, risk factors for maternal suicide, we thought would be particularly interesting to share with you all. Hopefully you can see this, uh, this slide uh, closely. And actually this is in our issue brief as well, but Cindy, I'll turn it over to you to talk a little bit about what are the risk factors for ideation? Um, and then what are the risk factors for actual suicide attempts or suicide deaths, which differ and quite fascinating. Yeah, um, actually, before that, I mean, I think it's really exciting that we've been seeing just an increase in su uh, research on maternal suicide. Um, and I'm only flagging a few that I thought was really interesting. Um, and both of them um, are conducted by uh, Holly Reed at the University of Manchester and her team. So they're doing some great work there. But in addition to that, there's been several systematic reviews and literature reviews about maternal suicide or attempts, um, ideation, you know, variations of that. So 
uh, if you're interested in that, I encourage you to go to PubMed or something and do a quick search because there's it's exciting to see that there's definitely more interest in this topic. Um, I found this one to be really interesting because it's broken down uh, for risk factors for suicidal self-harm and ideation and suicide attempts and then suicide death and suicide self-harm ideation and suicide attempt. So um, obviously there is, it's like a Venn diagram of sorts where there are things that overlap. Um, but to highlight that one of the biggest risk factors for suicide death is abuse um, during adulthood only or um, interpersonal violence. Um, so that that is something that I think more work is definitely going to be done on the relationship between abuse and suicide death. Um, Suicide attempts, the biggest risks were abuse during childhood only and adverse childhood experiences. So, you know, that may be an opportunity for us to look at ACEs, you know, in pregnant moms and screening them for that. And also social support, lack of social support was a big contributor of that. Um, and sort of, you know, fanning out a little bit, obviously stress, mother, infant bonding, um, loneliness, body image, satisfaction, and hopelessness, that really factored into suicidal self-harm ideation and suicide attempts. And then also suicidal self-harm ideation. There's a lot of other factors. Um, as, as we know um, that the, the etiology of maternal suicide is very complex. And I thought that this did a really, really great job of just showing the, the, the world of um, the different factors of maternal suicide that can be ideation or self-harm and then deaths and attempts. And so it, it kind of illustrates risk factors for that. Thank you, Cindy. I, I also wanted to just call out, I know some of you um, on, on with us now are, are likely picking up on that statement about IPV um, under suicide deaths the, on the left-hand side there abuse, you know, suicide deaths being linked to um, active abuse or during adulthood and or pregnancy and specifically calling out inter interpersonal violence um, being a risk factor. So I thought that was interesting to flag. I know there've been champions for wanting to screen for IPV more broadly. Um, and so we'll see if that's, uh, if that's where the field heads. Um, the other thing that I thought was worth teasing out just a bit, or at least flagging that there's a real opportunity to address at greater length is the role of um, substance use disorder for, for obvious uh, reasons and the intersection, which the CDC has certainly um, called out in uh, combining both suicide overdose um, um, under maternal mental health conditions being the leading cause of uh, of maternal um, pregnancy related maternal death. Uh, so, so more to come on SUD as well. It's an area that uh, here at the policy center, we're wanting to dive into um, in, at greater length. Um, so um, Cindy, uh, we'll move on to the last slide, which is, which is um, just Q and A. We're going to open it up for Q and A, but as I'm about to call out some of the questions here, I wanted to turn it back to you, Cindy. Is there anything else that you wanted to to say in closing um, before we open it up to, to Q&A? Um, I think there was one additional study that I uh, had wanted to highlight. It was also by, by Holly Reed um, at the University of Manchester and her team. And I thought this was really interesting. It was um, a grounded theory research. So basically interviewing moms um, who were either suicidal during the perinatal period or attempted suicide. And she kind of came up with this theorized process of uh, psychological factors about moms experiencing suicidal thoughts and then making the attempt. And what, what really is interesting to me is that she said most of the mothers felt attacked by motherhood, which led them to feel like a failure, a bad mother, and you know subsequent appraisals of entrapment or defeat. Um, and if nothing resolved this distress, distress being a key word here, um, then something, the opportunity or the impulse of, of committing suicide happens and that's when the attempt happens. Um, and just to highlight that, I thought that was very interesting, um, just very interesting data 
most of the participants stressed that the onset of suicidal thoughts was really rapid. And so um, to follow up on what we should be doing with that information is that, you know, healthcare professionals should really, really make an effort to inquire about the mom's feelings, the babies and isolation and how she feels herself with that mom. And, you know, as we all know, stigma is a big part of maternal mental health disorders and suffering and silence and shame. And so um, this study is very interesting. So I encourage you to also look that up at that theoretical model that they have about the thought process of what what makes a mom suicidal in in these particular cases so great thank you cindy and as i mentioned earlier those um, clinics that are screening particularly ob clinics if there's anyone interested or er's um, on the line interested in in looking at partnering around implementation of the zero suicide framework we'd love to hear from you um we have a few great questions that have popped into chat we have about four minutes if we don't get to your questions um, we will drop into chat an email address that you can email uh, email those questions in. But I did want to flag, I think, a, a good question that others may have as well is, where can I found out, find out more information about intrusive thoughts? So I dropped into chat a link to our webpage that um, highlights some of the work that we did with the International OCD Foundation, um, who's really leading um, the research and efforts around not only OCD itself, but intrusive thoughts um, often associated with OCD, but does, they don't have to be associated with OCD. So you can learn more about um, that work on the, on the link that I shared. I also just wanted to flag that um, the CDC has uh, just recently released last week, a um, new report on uh, women feeling um, mistreated during maternity care. One in five women um, reporting mistreatment while receiving maternity care. I just dropped that into chat. And we just want to acknowledge that this certainly um, can play into perhaps not increased risk of suicide, although that could be the case, but certainly distress um, and risk for maternal mental health conditions um, more broadly. So a couple other questions that came in um, some of you have asked about various uh, uh, slides that we shared, and I can't really tell what slide you're talking about. So feel free to email us if you if we don't answer your question. Um, one of the questions is like, are we comparing apples to apples with the rates in the United States of maternal mortality or maternal suicide and other countries? And my um, my understanding is that the answer is yes, that they're using World Health Organization definitions, but I think that's a really um, interesting question. So we'll follow up to be sure, but um, I'm quite certain that at least the CDC, the data that the CDC is reporting um, is looking at apples to apples there, but good question. Um, other questions that have come in are about uh, the slides and the recording. We are gonna share the recording in the slides um, after today's session. We'll put them on our maternal suicide webpage along with this recording, and we'll send that out through um, Zoom for all of you that registered. Um, and then people are asking for the resources that Cindy shared around this research at the very end. We'll definitely um, share that. And then we have a couple personal stories that have come in um, from clinicians and non-clinicians about um, distress and suicide and risk. So I, I appreciate those of you who shared um, that information for sharing them. We'll pull those um, stories out. And if you're willing to share them more broadly with us, we'd love for you to do so in, in another setting and you can email us and, and let us know. Um, the last question that I'll raise before we wrap up today, um, I think this is really interesting. This comes from Erica. Erica, thanks for this question. Cindy, you might have thoughts here. Um, if not, we'll follow up with folks um, who are experts in in uh, the cultural and ethnic variations um, around maternal suicide. And really this question from Erica is like, are there some pr protective factors that are sort of built into various races and ethnicities that might um, uh, result in lower suicide rates, actual suicide rates in um, non-white populations? That's such an interesting question. And I will also flag the role of um, firearms in the home does seem to be at play, which we think there's some variation perhaps in white and non-white populations. We'll pull those studies um, and share them with anyone that are that is interested. And then Cindy, I'm turning it back over to you for the last word on that question and to wrap us up. Um, that's a great question. And I, I would say a short answer is yes. 
Um, longer answer, I think there definitely needs to be more research done. Um, uh, drawing from personal experience and the literature that I've read, not just in the US, but you know, in Asia and the UK and Europe on maternal suicide. This is this is a global issue, not just a US one. I want to emphasize Australia. Um, there's been reviews on that. Um, there's definitely protective factors in certain cultures, but you so being Asian myself, you know, uh, we usually have a protective factor that some people call doing the month where mom stays in bed um, and is taken care of by family members um, for a month. But, you know, being someone that is that is here in America where I don't have access to my family like that is something that not everybody, you know, if they don't live in their native home country or have access to that, um, may not have access to those protective factors. But yes, there are definitely, you know, we see, I think, in cultures that have stronger bonds of other people helping the mom during the postpartum period, um, there's definitely protective factors for that. Um, but there are risk factors too, I think, you know, and so it's kind of a balance and definitely more research is needed in that area. A great question. Yeah, very good. Well, with that, we thank you for joining us for this fireside chat and encourage you to email us. If you have questions, um, you can do that through our website or you're welcome to email me. Um, I'll drop uh, my email into chat here quickly. And uh, thank you again, everyone for joining us today. We appreciate it and look forward to seeing you on a future webinar or in our e-news. Uh, and last, um, last thing I'll share is that we have an upcoming um, forum on maternal mental health, and we encourage you to register. Registration will go up uh, next week, and we hope to see you online uh, for the forum as well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you.